This morning we'd like you to look with us at Jeremiah chapter 28. Jeremiah was a colorful prophet. And he would often do things that would attract attention to the message that he was seeking to bring to the people. And so Jeremiah made this little wooden yoke and he put it over his neck and he was wearing this wooden yoke through the streets of Jerusalem. Wherever he would go, you would see Jeremiah in this wooden yoke over his neck. The yoke gives the idea of servitude. And Jeremiah was preaching to the people that they were going to go into servitude to Babylon. That they were, even those that had yet escaped uh, the bondage of Babylon, were going to be going into servitude to Babylon. There was sort of a general rebellion among the people against the Babylonian authority. Uh, they were foolishly thinking to uh, uh, rebel against uh, the control of Babylon. And Jeremiah was saying, don't do it, uh, because it's only going to bring your destruction. Uh, Babylon is going to prevail. God has seen fit to uh, put the powers of the world into the hands of the king of Babylon at this time, and to fight against that is to really fight against God. And so he was wearing this yoke around, and the people, uh, of course, were remarking on it. A lot of them were angry with it. Uh, they, they didn't like uh, the message that Jeremiah was proclaiming. Uh, they wanted fiercely their independence, and uh, they uh, were... Uh, upset with Jeremiah. Well, in chapter 28, Jeremiah is in the temple of the Lord, and there is this other prophet who was there. He was a false prophet. And uh, as Jeremiah came in with this wooden yoke, this fellow Hananiah, the false prophet, began to Give a false prophecy. He said, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. So he uh, is, is contradicting what Jeremiah has been saying, that they were going to be brought under the yoke. And he said, The Lord has said, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. And within two years will I bring again into this place all of the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon took away from this place and carried to Babylon. And I will bring again to this place Jeconiah the son of Jehoiakim the king of Judah with all of the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, saith the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. So here's Jeremiah standing there with this wooden yoke on him and proclaiming, you know, that they were going to come under the yoke. And Hananiah says, Thus saith the Lord, I've broken the yoke of Babylon. Within two years, all of the treasures of the temple that were carried away by Nebuchadnezzar shall be returned and all of the captives that have gone into the land of Babylon will come back. So Jeremiah said, well, amen. The Lord do so. May the Lord perform your words and restore the things that were taken. He, he said that though in a sort of a mocking way, because he knew better. 
And so he said, well, amen, and let the Lord do it. But then Jeremiah went on to prophesy the word of the Lord. But with Jeremiah's sort of um, meek kind of response to begin with, this guy Hananiah came down to where Jeremiah was and he took the yoke from Jeremiah and he broke the thing in pieces. And uh, he declared, Thus saith the Lord, I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, from the neck of all of the nations within two years. So Jeremiah said, You have broken the yoke of wood, but you shall make yokes of iron, for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron on all of these nations that they might serve Nebuchadnezzar and they shall serve him. And then Jeremiah, turning to this false prophet, said, The Lord has not sent you, but you have made these people to trust in a lie. So, we had this confrontation and we have Two prophets that are prophesying diametrically opposed kind of prophecies. The one is saying that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, is going to bring the nations under his yoke. The other is saying God is going to break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, it seems like always there are those false prophets who have existed, existed during biblical days, and do exist to the present time. Those men who are speaking supposedly in the name of the Lord, for Hananiah that was saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, and purportedly speaking for God in the name of the Lord, and yet, as Jeremiah said to them, you are prophesying lies, and you are making the people to trust in lies. There are men going around today speaking in the name of the Lord, who are in reality false prophets who, as Hananiah, are causing the people to trust in lies. They are saying things that the people like to hear. Now, what God has to say isn't always pleasant. If you are living and walking in sin, God says you've got to repent or you're going to perish. Now, we don't like to hear that. The false prophets say, well, it really doesn't matter what you do. God is so loving and good, he would never punish anyone, would he, you know? And, and, and uh, so people are attracted by the false prophets because the messages that they give are things that appeal to the flesh. And so we hear those false prophets today that say, well, God wants you to be rich. God wants you to have the finest. And uh, you are the children of God and thus you're children of the king and God wants you to live like children of the king. And you know, cover your fingers with diamonds and all. Uh, and God, you know, wants me to have all of this wealth to live in luxury. God wants you to be healed. He doesn't want you to know a day of sickness. Or they tell you we're entering into a day of power. And within the next few years, the manifested sons of God are going to take over the world and 
We're going to reveal the power of God and we're going to come with all kinds of dynamics and power, you know, to be manifested before the world as God's son. And the world is going to come and bow at your feet and recognize that you are the sons of God. Now, those things sound very alluring and very attractive. And, and we find that many, many people are being swayed by these false prophets. But the bottom line of the false prophet usually is, and God wants you to send your money to me. <laughs> and some of them even suggest that if you don't have any money to send, go out and borrow it and send your money to me. And oftentimes there is that suggestion that by the sending of your money, you are demonstrating the kind of faith that will get you the healing that you desire or the answer to your prayers. And they will have testimonies of people who were wanting their unsaved son to be saved from drugs and they sent the money in and their son came to the Lord and all. And, and the suggestion is sort of subtly that you can buy God off. You know, a little bribe here or there and you can get the favors from God that you're really desiring. But this kind of a thought was thoroughly denounced in the Bible uh, in the times of uh, the apostles when Peter and John had come to the city of uh, Samaria where Philip had been preaching and the power of God was being manifested through Peter and John, this fellow Simon, who was a sorcerer, he came to Peter and he said, how much would it cost me to, uh, I'd like to buy this kind of power that you have, that I could go around doing the things that you're doing. And Peter said, your money perish with you. You better repent. Your heart isn't right before God because you think that the gifts of God can be purchased with money. And thus it was known in the church as simony, that attempt to buy favors or to buy the work of God or the power of God or the gifts of God. And there is that subtle suggestion, though. One of the latest gimmicks is, is the business of, of making a faith vow to God. And so I want you to write, the fellow says, and make a vow of faith to God that you'll give a thousand dollars. Now, you don't have to have the thousand dollars. It's just a vow that you're going to make to God of faith to give a thousand dollars and watch how God will provide. And, and he gets all these people to write in and send in their vow of faith. I'm going to give a thousand dollars to the ministry, you know, by faith. And then, you know, you're, it doesn't mean that you have it, but, you know, watch God provide for it. And, and then he begins to done people for not sending in and do you know how horrible it is to make a vow and he gives you all these scriptures it's better not to vow you know than to make a vow and break it and puts them under all the pressure to then fulfill that vow of a thousand dollars which he called a faith vow in the beginning now these men who speak so much about faith and the potential of faith how is it that they don't seem to have enough faith for their own ministry or their own finances? How is it they're always wanting you to exercise your faith in giving to them, but they don't seem to have enough faith to just trust God to bring it in themselves? You know, if you just think things through, there's something phony, and you can always see through a false prophet. You, you know, there's really no excuse, uh, except that... Uh, they say things we want to hear. And, 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 and with every racket, with every uh, fraud, there is that um, appeal to the greed within man. 
and, and thus the seed faith, just send in seed faith and God will return to you a hundredfold, you know. And uh, this, this seed faith idea, you know, you exercise your faith and, and give a hundred dollars to God in faith and see if God doesn't give you a thousand back. And, all, and the greed, and, and, and they appeal to people's greed. But the problem is, and the evil of it, is that as Jeremiah said to Hananiah, you've caused the people to trust in a lie. People put their trust in things that aren't true. And thus they give false hopes unto people. It's rather sad that when we get desperate that we oftentimes do not even rationally look at things anymore. But we are willing to grasp at any slight ray of hope. There are people who have terminal illnesses. They are beyond the scope of the ability of the doctors and medical science to cure. When a person gets to this place, they get many times so desperate for healing that they'll subscribe to all kinds of bizarre treatments that promise healing where others failed. So often they'll go to Tijuana because, you know, down in Mexico, they have so many fabulous cures that are being withheld from the American uh, public by these doctors who are conspiring together because, after all, uh, you know, if, if uh, they could show you that you can be healed of your uh, cancer without surgery, then what are all of the breast surgeons going to do? And uh, thus they are conspiring to keep you from this new, you know, area of medicine whereby you can be cured. And people go down there by the droves and pay out millions of dollars uh, for some quack who promises to cure them. Uh, I received a letter this week from uh, a, a fellow whose daughter has uh, uh, cancer, lymph and it's in the lymph, uh, lymphomia. And, and some clinic down in Houston, the only one in the United States that offers this treatment, and it's only allowed on an experimental basis, but it's, you know, being used around the world. And, and uh, they've, they've examined his daughter, and, uh, you know, she's getting worse with the cures over, with our normal type of medicines, but this fellow is promising that uh, he, you know, 90% of the cases that come to his clinic are cured and uh, that hers is a good candidate for being cured. It only costs him $15,000 a month for the next 11 months and he can cure uh, the daughter of, of this uh, cancer in, in the lymph glands and so forth. But, you know, when the other doctors give up hope and they say, well, there's nothing we can do, you know, you're, you're open. You, you, and the, the tragedy is, is that you begin to trust in a lie. You put your hope in something that is going to ultimately just leave you devastated and it'll leave you broke or heavily in debt. And this fellow was seeking help. If he could just get a bunch of his friends to... Give $50 a month, you know, and spread it out over many people. Uh, then, you know, his daughter can be cured. Well, 
Yes, you want to see his daughter cured of cancer, but oh my. How tragic it is for people to put their hopes in false promises. And thus, these false prophets of God giving false promises are causing people to hope in a lie. And thus, this prophet Hananiel, uh, here Jeremiah is saying, you know, you're going to be brought into servitude to Babylon. Don't rebel. It's only going to uh, make things worse. But surrender and it'll go well with you. But they're saying, no, no, rebel. God's going to give you victory. God's going to destroy the Babylonian power. Look, the yoke of Babylon is broken, thus saith the Lord. And he had caused the people to trust in these lies. It may sound great, but it just simply is not true. Their only hope was in repentance and turning to God and asking God's forgiveness for their evil. But you see, this gave them a way out without repentance. You can continue in your sin and you're going to be all right. You can continue in these practices and things are going to turn out okay. That's not so. That's a lie. And the lie caused them to turn from the very and the only thing that would save them. And they were trusting in a lie because the false prophet was there speaking in the name of the Lord. The false prophets today are causing people to have false hopes. They create the idea that God can be manipulated by man, that you can write your own ticket and create your own reality through faith. But when the dreams do not become reality, many people then blame God for their continued financial problems that have only been uh, worsened by the fact that they now have to pay off the loan to the bank that they made to send to that false prophet. As a shepherd, I'm concerned for the flock of God. God has commanded me to feed his sheep, not to fleece his sheep. But I think it's important that we warn you that there are wolves out there who are disguised as shepherds, but their only desire is to fleece the flock of God. Their bottom line is always to send support to their ministry. But how sad it is when people will trust in their lies. God says one thing, the false prophet says another. God said to Adam, if you eat of that tree, you will surely die. Satan said, you will not die. Now, who do you believe? Do you believe God or do you believe Satan? God's word said to Adam, you'll die. Satan said, you won't die. Adam made a very foolish mistake. He believed Satan and he died when he ate of the tree. Jeremiah was saying Babylon is going to capture and destroy the city and bring you under their yoke. Hananiah was saying God has broken the yoke of Babylon. And within two years the captives will be set free. Who are you going to believe? Well the people were believing Hananiah because he was saying the things they wanted to believe. Lies are oftentimes much more appealing than the truth. And look how Satan is capturing the people of the world through lies. The Bible says there is only one God, one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. The false prophets are saying, well, all roads lead to God. Jesus is just one of the many ways by which people are coming to God today. 
that all religions have their value and have their good. And that to say that Jesus is the only way is just too narrow. And it's too limiting. And thus you have God's word saying one thing. You have these false prophets saying another thing. Who are you going to believe? The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. The false prophets say, well, God is too good to punish anyone. Who are you going to believe? The Bible says that God will supply all of your needs in glo- all of your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus our Lord. The false prophet says you've got to supply all of God's needs by sending to his ministry. Who are you going to believe? Do you believe in a God that supports you or believe in a God that you've got to support? Jeremiah came to the prophet Hananiah And he said, the Lord did not send you. You're not of God. I've written many letters to many of these evangelists who send out their appeals. And I've told them the same thing as Jeremiah said. The Lord did not tell you to say that. You know, they... They will send their letters that uh, are addressed uh, to dear Charles. You know, well, nobody calls me Charles, but (laughs) that's their computer. This morning, as my wife and I were in prayer, the Lord laid you on our heart. And we had such a burden for you, we just couldn't get it. couldn't get free of it. We prayed and prayed, but yet somehow the Lord didn't share exactly what your need is. Write, Charles, and tell us what your need is. How we wish we could be there with you in your room, you know, there in the print your address and so forth, and, and just pray with you personally. But if you will write to us, we'll be glad to pray for you, you know, and, and, and help us to understand what this great burden is that God put on us. We can't sleep because we're so concerned about you. And, and incidentally, when you write, could you enclose an offering for our ministry? We're going through such desperate times right now. Uh, maybe you could go out and borrow the money. And, and I get these letters, and I write back and I say, the Lord didn't lay me on your heart. You weren't praying for me. You're a liar. And God didn't send you with this message. And I, I'm like Jeremiah. I'll, I'll, I'll write to them. It gets me off their list. <laughs> but Jeremiah said, the Lord didn't send you with this message. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast you from off the face of the earth, and this year you will die, because you have taught rebellion against the Lord. Find out who the true and the false prophet is. You say within two years the yoke of Babylon will be broken. I say within a year you'll be dead. (laughs) Now we'll find out the true and the false prophet. You know, back when they were having the Olympics here in the Los Angeles uh, area a few years ago, there was uh, some fellow who had come with these dire predictions that during the Olympics there was going to be a major earthquake that uh, was going to shake Southern California. And he had had all of these visions of earthquakes and predictions of earthquakes before. and, 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 And a lot of people were upset. Some people even moved out of the state. And if you'll remember at that time when people were saying, did you hear about these predictions and so forth? And it was so widespread that I felt that it was important that uh, I address it from the pulpit. And so 
If you'll remember, I said, uh, I predict there won't be a great earthquake during the Olympics here in Southern California. I said, when the Olympics are over, we'll find out who the true prophet is and who the false prophet is. Well, here Jeremiah sort of laid it on the line. Within a year, you'll be dead. Because you're not really sent by God. You are a false prophet. And the result of your prophecy is that you've caused the people to rebel against the, 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 the word of the Lord. They're, they're trusting in a lie. They don't think that they have to repent. They think that they can just go ahead and continue in their sinful practices. They're going to get by with it. And if you think that you can continue in sin and get by with it, you're being deceived. If you're resting in some kind of a hope or, 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 or the word of somebody that, you know, well, God is so loving, he'll never punish evil. You're, you're, you're being deceived and you're trusting in a lie. If you think that you can get by in sin without paying the consequences, you're being deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he is going to reap. And so Jeremiah said, within the year, you'll be dead. And we read, and in the seventh month of that year, Hananiah died. We found out who the true prophet was and the false prophet. And Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians and they carried away the rest of the artifacts from the temple to Babylon, the two pillars, the brass pillars, the whole thing. It was devastated. But the tragedy was that when the people should be repenting and turning to God and seeking God, they were trusting in the lies that caused their hearts to continue to rebel against the warnings of God. We must all determine, am I going to believe God's word or the word of man? Some man who says he's speaking for God. Well, I'll tell you what. I have every reason in the world to believe what God has said. And I really don't have any reason to believe no matter how attractive and glorious it may sound, I have no reason to believe what man may say that contradicts what God has said. I'll go with God's word. Now, let me take this one step further. God has said, that if you would confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you would be saved. Now, Satan so often comes along and says, Oh, how do you know you're saved? You can't be saved. Look at this. Look at that. And he begins to point out uh, the flaws that you have. Now, I'm not surprised that he can find flaws in me. I know of many flaws. Some he hasn't even pointed out yet. But he is always pointing the finger of guilt, saying, well, how could God forgive or how could God love? I don't know how, but I know he does because he said he does. I know he has forgiven me because he has said he has forgiven me. And so I have to either believe God's word or I have to believe Satan's doubts. And Satan will come and lie to you about the work of God in your life. The will and the purposes of God for your life. God said, I know my thoughts toward you that they are good. And, and we're going to get that next week in Jeremiah there. It's great scripture. I love it. They are good, God said, not evil. I intend to accomplish my purposes in you. And Satan says, you better watch out, boy. You submit yourself to God. Something awful is going to happen. You know, it's just terrible, terrible what happens, you know, with people. 
You just never know. Who are you going to believe? Let God be true and every man a liar. You can put your trust in the word of God. You can put your confidence in the word of God. He will never, never lead you astray. Father, we thank you for your word that you have established it forever. And with thee, it is yes, amen. There's neither shadow nor variableness of turning with thee. Lord, you are faithful, so faithful. And Lord, help us to question the word of man and always to put our confidence and trust in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? God's word said the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. To think you're going to get by with your sin is to trust in a lie. You're being deceived. But if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so today, You can go out and say, well, I don't know if to believe that guy or not. Well, that's fine. Don't ask you to believe me. I ask you to believe God's word. Just take his word for it. And anything that I say that is contradictory or, or away from this, then please don't believe it because you're in bad shape if you do. I'm here to proclaim to you what God has said. And God loves you. And God has provided a way by which you can be forgiven your sins. And that way is through his son, Jesus Christ. And there is salvation in no other. There's only one way that God has ordained whereby you can be forgiven and spend eternity with him. And I would encourage you to receive God's provisions through Christ that he offers to you. God bless you. As we come to the end of the old year and the beginning of the new, may the Lord strengthen you. May the Lord bless you. And may the Lord cause this to be a glorious new year of opportunities of knowing him, serving him. In Jesus' name.